about some introductions. I know a lot of people on here know each other, but maybe there might be a few that don't. We have 19 people so far, and I know there may be others who might be coming. A lot of people had RSVP'd, and then some people will come in and out as they need to for the time that we're together. So come and go as everybody pleases. So why don't we start off the introductions? Why don't you start off for us, Eric? Maybe say your name, your location, what you do, and I don't know, anything else fun you want to add in. Oh, excellent. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, my name is Eric Yang. I run the UCLA Cardio Oncology Program here in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, I, it's been in, it's basically official in name in 2000, since 2016, although I had been starting the program or at least starting to see the patients years before that. Um, I've been on faculty there since 2011 outside of fellowship. My clinical interests are imaging, medical education, as I'm also the APD for a fellowship, as, and, um, and just basically, you know, really what's been my most kind of my, my recent passion within the field really has been really trying to figure out how we can most more effectively integrate, you know, training and curriculum. As Sherry Ann knows, we worked on a paper together as well, and, that, and Nikhil as well, looking at the real world integration of with, without an official program, how can you do it already in the general level? And I think that's a challenge that we have to overcome in order to really expose the future generations who are really the key, I think, to this field. Because in general, a lot of people just won't know until they're exposed. I mean, for me, I didn't really, you know, I really didn't really have any inkling of interest of it until I myself was actually being asked to see these patients. And then you never know who's really going to get fired up for that as well. So, um, so that's, uh, that's me. And uh, yeah, I'll hand it off to Richard. Uh, he's not he's next on my video list that's okay right. we were we were yeah, both co-fellows and co-residents as well too so yeah no eric and i actually know each other very well i still remember um you know going to acc in new orleans those are good times um yeah so i'm one of the heart care cardiologists you, you remember that richard oh that's good i i do remember that <laughs> yeah so i'm one of the heart cardiologists here at university of washington in seattle i oversee the cardio oncology program at University of Washington Fred Hutch Cell Cancer Care Alliance. I'm also the program director for Heart Fair Fellowship. Um, you know, my interest originally in cardio oncology was really in heart failure, um, as well as the aspects of cancer and transplant and LVAD. So, you know, I was actually texting with Eric earlier. Somehow, no matter what I do, I end up going back to doing research in breast cancer. Um, so we're part of a number of very large cohorts. Um, you know, and you'll probably be seeing some stuff from our group um, looking at survivorship and long-term breast um, cancer patients. I'll pass on to someone else, whoever wants to take over now. Giselle. Oh, oh Giselle or Nicole. <laughs> Keep handing off to the next person. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Giselle. I am calling in from New Jersey. I am a, currently a chief resident at New Jersey, uh, Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. I am a future fellow in uh, cardiology at MGH. I've been very interested in uh, cardio-oncology for a little couple of years, started more towards um, being around oncologists and seeing some of the side effects on, uh, of the immunotherapies and discover the amazing world of cardio-oncology. And I'm super excited and grateful to be here. I will pass it on to Mary. <laughs> Thanks, Giselle. Um, I am a, a cardiology fellow. I'm a T32 research and clinical fellow at Wake Forest uh, Baptist Health. I'll have another just over a year left the fellowship, kind of looking for jobs in between academic and private and still wanting to pursue research, but it's kind of tricky during this era. So we'll see how things uh, flesh out, but really enjoy cardio-oncology, the community. I think that's what drew me to, um, to, to this field initially, um, as well as sort of the nuances. I knew I always wanted to be sort of different. Um, and so cardio-oncology allows me to kind of be in this sort of nuanced field that includes genetics and, um, just a different aspect of cardiology. So I'm still enjoying it, still trying to advocate for it and my program, I'm still getting excited over cases. So I think it's, it's meant to be. So it's just certainly a privilege to be with everybody. Who should I send it to? Uh, whoever wants to go, go next. Diego, maybe? 
All right. <laughs> Sounds good. <clears throat> hey guys, um, I'm Diego Sadler. Um, I'm a cardio oncologist at Cleveland Clinic, Florida. I've been doing uh, my background prior to in my previous life before cardio oncology and uh, done clinical cardiology, echocardiography, and nuclear cardiology. Uh, for the last five years, I've been working in cardio oncology. Um, I'm very interested in advocacy and access to care in cardio oncology. Um, I chair the cardio oncology committee for the Florida chapter of the ACC, and I'm in the uh, cardio oncology ACC leadership council. And uh, we have a global collaborative network, and um, we're very interested in getting all these great knowledge and um, advances that we get in all these areas of cardio oncology that we all enjoy and thrive and get excited about to uh, make sure that this applies not just a small segment of the US population, but that we can address how to improve access to care in cardio oncology to larger segments of the community, including both academic and community centers, and also to address disparities in cardio oncology. Yes, that's about it. So I'll pass it to, I don't know, I logged in late. I don't know. Eric, did you talk already? Uh, yes, I did, but I can oh. uh, relay it over to, uh, let's relay it to Nikhil. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Nikhil Bassi. It's good to uh, meet some of you. Some of you I actually saw last year at the ACC Cardio Oncology Conference in Washington, D.C. Um, and I recently graduated from the UCLA Cardiology Fellowship Program and worked closely with uh, Eric Yang, um, who was not only my associate program director, but also my clinic preceptor. And that's how I got involved in the cardio oncology space and just trying to build up our cardio oncology program here at Hoke Hospital in Newport Beach, uh, California. I'm working with uh, Dipti Ichaporia as well. So good to see everyone. And yeah, I also kind of joined late. Um, so I'm not sure who hasn't spoken yet, maybe Arjun Ghosh. Arjun, oh. you're muted. And then if we don't hear from Arjun, then let's go to Avi. Sorry. Um, I Sorry, I was on mute there. Th thanks a lot, Shoyan, for the uh, kind invitation. Um, cardiologist at Barts Heart Center in UCLH, and I run the cardio oncology program at UCLH in London. Really uh, happy to be joining you all here and looking forward to the uh, interaction and the nice discussions. Do you want to go next, Avi? Hey, uh, thanks for the invitation, uh, Sherry, and, and uh, thanks for organizing this. Um, uh, so basically, Cardio Oncology Innovation Network, I really like because, I mean, I guess, uh, I guess there's a, I call it sort of the middle layer in between sort of the people who write New England papers and then people who want to get into Cardio Oncology, and we are here to motivate you to get into Cardio Oncology. Um, I think Cardio Oncology is a field which uh, is in infancy. Uh, my focus has been a research um, and um, yeah, uh, specifically working with various um, uh, data science sources to, to develop uh, sort of epidemiological research in cardio oncology. Uh, was uh, happy to participate in multiple papers uh, with Cherry Ann on, we put in our experience of what we did during our fellowships. Uh, Eric was also there, Nikhil was also there, Arjun was also there on that paper. Um, and happy to work with uh, people who are interested in uh, cardio oncology research to get it forward. Also wanted to sort of put a word out for the cardio oncology bot I created that. So anytime you uh, put in a hashtag of cardio on your tweet, it'll get a retweet from the bot. And I would say to follow that to get like, it's like a table of contents, so to speak, for all journals, as long as somebody puts in the hashtag cardio with their tweet. So thank you so much for the invite. I'll pass it back to Arjun because he has to mention his experience now. Thanks. Well, um, I guess in terms of uh, cardio oncology experience, having helped to set up the programs at uh, 
uh, Bart's Heart Center, which is Europe's largest cardiac center. Uh, that's really probably where my experience is in the field of cardiology, and I lead the uh, training program for cardiology locally. This is something that uh, I'm very passionate about, and that was kind of one of the reasons I was involved in that great paper that uh, Avi has already mentioned about training in cardiology. So that's really one of my interest areas, and of course, um, involved in a number of uh, research uh, projects as well, allied to this. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's, I guess, my, my background. So um, thanks a lot. Well, I guess I'll talk. <clears throat> uh, I'm Ron Crone. I'm at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And um, we have a, actually an interesting program. Uh, we had a merger of two hospitals about 20 years ago, uh, Jewish and Barnes. And I've been a Jewish, and uh, it was about a block away from Barnes. And when we merged, uh, all the people at uh, Barnes, the Barnes cardiologists, really didn't want to walk over to Jewish because it was so far away. And so I did that, and it turned out that the hospital was converted to an oncology hospital that sort of evolved into a, a the Siteman Cancer Setup. Um, and uh, I started doing all these con uh, oncology consults with, instead of general cardiology. And I kind of liked it. It was the thing I liked about it was it was a very uh, finite group of consulting physicians. You know, you got to know the oncologists and you dealt directly with them uh, rather than dealing with an amorphous group of uh, unknown people. And so you really developed a nice, uh, a nice uh, collegial relationship with the uh, referring physicians. And um, it became very close. We did email consults for a long time. And then uh, about three or four years ago, Dan Lanahan came after he left uh, Vanderbilt and uh, got a lot of support from our chief at that point. And so we actually, uh, went, it went big time in terms of um, uh, a lot of clinic space, uh, openings in the clinic, able to do consults uh, with, with, with ease and uh, basically worked into the um, relationship with the oncologist so that they knew they could get a consult very easily and um, had interactions. We have an amyloid group uh, with uh, multi, uh, uh, with, with a gastroenterologist, uh, obviously a, uh, uh, a bone marrow uh, oncologist, a hematologist, and um, uh, it's, it's really kind of grown. It's also we've had the opportunity then. There's a lot of interest in the uh, in our fellows, and so we're trying to uh, set up a uh, fellowship. And we have had a, a number of uh, fellows now the last couple of years, and it just seems to just take off. People are interested in it. The uh, cardiac fellows are interested. In it. We have a number of fellows that are going into cardio oncology, uh, either with us or with someplace else. And um, the key thing is just ha having a lot of interest, a, a lot of um, interactions with the oncologist and being accessible. Um, and I think that they are beginning to understand uh, that they need us. And I think that's it's really kind of fun. Um, I've really enjoyed the fact that this is getting off the ground. I, I actually started uh, 10 years ago. There was a great meeting in Milan. We like to travel. Unfortunately, not this year. But uh, we met with the uh, European uh, a cancer center, which was based in Milan, and had a wonderful opportunity to have a, a, a meeting with them and um, uh, actually published uh, the, the proceedings in a series of manuscripts that was in Progress in Cardiovascular Disease. So this has been going on for a while, but it's just taken off like crazy in the last, uh, I'd say the last couple of years. So uh, this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, group, and it's interesting to see, you know, what, what comes of it. So thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Ron. We can keep the introductions going with popcorn. If you haven't been introduced yet, please go ahead and jump right in. Don't worry about having to choose somebody after you. Hey, guys, this is uh, Roy Podgill. Um, and uh, um, I'm Canadian. I uh, did all my education in Canada, and then I did fellowship at MD Anderson Cancer Center for Cardio Oncology. I was there for three and a half years doing basic science, clinical research, and clinical fellowship. And uh, currently I'm in uh, Cleveland Clinic uh, at Cleveland. And uh, uh, I'm lucky to be working with Diego Sadler over here. And uh, we are trying to push for a global registry right now. I don't know how many people have heard. So we have funding for it. And, um, and um, uh, we want everybody to join into that uh, uh, initiative. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. 
Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead. Come on. Dr. Go Zaza. ahead. No, go Thank ahead, you. please. Go ahead. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Israya Sin, a, a cardiology clinical pharmacist from Iraq. Um, uh, during my first uh, uh, initial career, I was uh, working in pediatric hemato oncology units. Uh, but at the, uh, during the last uh, eight years, uh, I'm working in uh, cardiology field. Uh, my interest is uh, cardio oncology now, combining uh, cardio. Uh, cardiology with the oncology, uh, interest in clinical research. Uh, over the last uh, five years, I was uh, working with the Euro Observational Research Program uh, as an um, investigator and data collection officer uh, in, uh, in Iraq at Baghdad Heart Center. Uh, so eager to work uh, with you all together. Thank you. Hi, my name is Azai Kobishuli. I'm from Israel, Tel Aviv. I'm working in cardio-oncology from 2013, we've established two cardio-oncology clinics. Right now in Israel, we have 15 centers who are giving the cardio-oncology service. And we're organizing and uh, people from here were our guests uh, a couple of weeks ago at our third uh, international meeting. And I'm interested in clinical cardio-oncology and we're promoting the field in Israel. Thank you to be invited here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my, uh, my name is Daniel Addison. Um, I'm the co-director of cardio-oncology here at The Ohio State University. I'm excited to be here with all of you. Um, you know, I've led this program for the last three or four years. Before this, previously, I was at the Mass General Hospital uh, where I worked uh, closely with folks like Tom Nealon and Udo Hoffman and many others. And within that space, we have worked diligently to continue to grow the collaborations, both locally and uh, beyond, uh, both with our cancer colleagues and well beyond with folks like John Bird and uh, Mary Musberg and many others who have been very supportive of, of our mission and what we're trying to do. Um, and I'd also like to uh, thank Sherry Ann again for organizing this reception. Uh, thank you. Excuse me. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. This is me, Dr. Hassan Farhan, consultant cardiology from uh, Baghdad Heart Center, Iraq. I'm the chairman of Scientific Council of Cardiology. And recently, before two years, we have established the recent uh, national uh, cardio oncology program in Baghdad and Iraq. And my interest in uh, teaching and training and global uh, research and uh, registry. And uh, we indeed need to help our patient from cardio-oncology perception. And I'm very glad to be joined with you in this uh, meeting. And this is a program for COIN. And uh, we hope all the success for all the effort. And thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, it's uh, my name is Juby Georgioze. I'm in New Jersey. I'm a um, nurse by training, but I run a digital health company with a group of doctors, nurses, technologists, and engineers. My former background is managing and designing complex disease management program for large population. Look at millions at the national scale. Um, so, um, the, I actually, you know, don't um, look at me and age me, but I think 18 or 19 years ago, I was able to, one of the early pilots of interventional drug eluding stents was uh, piloted. Um, I was uh, the person who actually made it happen to, in, on the reimbursement scale uh, through New York City, Lenoxville, Cornell, Columbia, that area. And since then, I had an interest in this area. And later on, I ended up uh, designing and executing an um, um, oncology program for Blue um, Cross and Blue Shield system. Um, and it blends a lot of data, population, and complex the case. And, and now my group is taking on something through LIDOS. LIDOS actually runs National Cancer Institute, multiple things inside. And uh, we are getting into that world, and I actually am very happy to be part of it and see um, what I can do and be, uh, I look forward to learning. 
One of the things is I blend tech, uh, healthcare, and um, compliance. So one of my background is blockchain. Blockchain is great for these um, registries. The future will come to tie to that, and some of the European ones are doing that. I helped um, design some of the standardizations in the genomics and some of the other places this kind of efforts are going on. So I just wanted to say that. Hi, my name is Anju Noria. I run the cardio-oncology program at Dana-Farber and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Mass. Um, thank you again, sherri Ann, for organizing this. I work in various areas of cardio-oncology, but my own research has mostly focused on the long-term cardiovascular complications of radiation therapy. I've also been lucky to collaborate with Tom Nealon and his group on all of his work on ICI myocarditis. And I wanted to put in a plug for Jack Cardio Oncology because I see that there's a lot of fellows and stuff on this call and we're very eager to hear from all of you. So please do send us all your work and uh, hopefully we can build a community as uh, Sherry Ann and everyone else is making efforts to do. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vijesh Patel. I'm currently practicing cardio oncology in West Virginia. I did my fellowship in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, at Lehigh Valley Hospital. Um, currently, um, so when I started the program, uh, along with my colleague, we had a, I spent about half a day per week, but our volume has grown tremendously to the point where um, I'm actually adding up one more day of entire day of my clinic that constitutes basically 50% of my outpatient time. And the fact is a lot of people are now recognizing that uh, cardiotoxicity and our role has been tremendous in these patients who have active cancer or those who go on to survive the cancer. And um, I, good thing is that some of our fellows and attendings both from cardiology and oncology side are participating in research, contributing their parts. And uh, currently we are working on many projects ranging from understanding the mechanism of disease and how some of these drugs um, interact uh, with cardio cardiology uh, conditions and um, you know, to all the way to like using machine learning and AIs to understand the interaction between cancer, cancer drugs, and um, uh, people who have or go on to develop heart conditions. So it's really exciting time. And uh, thank you for sharing Ann and others to put together such a nice group of um, people who share the same interest. Um, and uh, looking forward to working with you all. Hi, this is, uh, this is Vlad Zaha. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Sherry for organizing. Um, I'm the medical director of uh, the cardio-oncology program at uh, UT Southwestern um, University in, in Dallas, Texas. And um, I've been here since 2016. Uh, I came from Yale. Um, my, my training took me a little bit around the world. So one of the places where I trained in advanced imaging was in fact at UCL. So I had some interactions uh, at uh, St. Bart's there. And um, my interest right now is um, in uh, translational uh, imaging as a modality to detect early changes in uh, the cardiovascular system in patients with uh, cancer and cancer treatments. Um, and um, uh, complementing here what uh, Anjanoria was mentioning some also uh, helping with uh, with a Jack Carty oncology, and I would encourage everybody to submit uh, manuscripts there. And I'm also associate editor for Circulation, um, and uh, now it's it's been a um, uh, more than a couple of years uh, since we had uh, a special uh, issue on uh, cardio oncology, which was uh, preceding the development of um, uh, Jack Carty oncology as a focused journal. So it's really a pleasure to interact with so many people around the world and uh, to see all this interest in cardio-oncology.
Has everyone has a chance to introduce yourself? Yes, this is uh, Hugo Martinez calling from Memphis. And you may hear my daughter in the background, but I'm a member of the cardio oncology group here at St. Jude Children's Hospital where our official program in cardio oncology opened a little less than five years ago. I had the pleasure to join uh, about three years ago after my heart failure training in Cincinnati. Um, suffice to say, I have the cultivated passion for education in cardio oncology and uh, genetics. So thank you, everybody. Hi, my name is Arnethia Sutton. I'm a cancer prevention and control postdoctoral fellow at Virginia Commonwealth University. And I also have a role at the Massey Cancer Center. Um, I'm actually pretty new to this space. So I trained in disparities research, um, particularly for breast cancer patients. Um, and recently I received a K99R00 through the NCI to understand multi-level factors that contribute to the disparities in cardiotoxicity amongst breast cancer patients. Um, so this is my um, first time here. So thank you very much for um, allowing me to be in this space. Hi everyone, I am Akshay, a recent graduate from Milan Azad Medical College, University of Delhi, and a current internal medicine residency applicant. And I'm excited to be here and to learn more about the interesting field of cardio-oncology. Thank you for inviting me. Has everyone got a chance to introduce yourself? Can I? Please do. Oh, yeah, hi, Sherry. Um, uh, I'm Alex Vinogradov. I'm a serial entrepreneur with 25 years experience. Uh, I've done 11 companies so far. And now I'm pushing a company called Heart In, which was created eight years ago and produce a smart ACG T-shirt, which provides the medical grade signal, but in the same time, good information for consumers on the app, like a heart rate, stress level, uh, uh, recovering challenging level and do screening for cardiovascular diseases in the back. Uh, I personally has a lot of uh, technical financial knowledges and digital health knowledges. So if you need any kind of help from me, you can easily reach me by LinkedIn or email. Thank you. Excellent. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Jennifer. Uh, one of the I'm a cardiology fellow at Yale. I'm interested in using uh, informatics as well as EHR and imaging to study cardio onc. One of my current ongoing projects is actually chip and heart failure. Uh, I'm also the APSA resident fellow co-chair. And we're interested in looking at ways that we can better support physician scientists. So for all the early career physician scientists who are on this call, uh, we have an upcoming session at the APSA ASCI AAP annual meeting featuring uh, Francis Collins, Claire Pomeroy, the president of Lasker Foundation, uh, and also the president of the Burroughs Welcome Fund who supports the uh, career development awards for physician scientists. And we're going to look at the impact of COVID-19 on early career physician scientists, as well as those who are looking for jobs right now. There's another issue that was raised up by uh, some of the applicants who are applying for jobs during the pandemic. And they mentioned how they like to fit people into either 80-20 or they will be 100% clinical. So I think one thing that people have been raising is the possibility of doing a 50-50 physician scientist career and to develop mechanisms to support that, including increasing grant types that are supporting transitional physician scientists who are planning for a 50-50 career. So that's just a heads up for those who are potentially interested. Uh, the annual meeting is coming up in April. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to us. I think we're going to try to do an advocacy effort and some surveying to better assess those who are interested in that career uh, pathway of 50-50 as opposed to doing 80-20, which is the traditional pathway for physician scientists. Thank you, Jen. Anyone else who hasn't had a chance to introduce yourself? Fantastic. We'll continue to have people coming and going. If there's anyone who hasn't um, introduced yourself, feel free to jump in at any time. 
And when you're speaking, feel free to say who you are again. I'm gonna share an informal agenda for us. And it's not like something where we'll have to go in order. It's more just some things that we can just think about discussing as we think about coin initiatives and you can talk about whichever ones you'd like. I've put them in, we have put them in order of the interest that people had expressed at the time of the coin summit in December, 2020. Thank you for everyone who was there. It was an absolutely amazing time. It was quite wonderful to be able to put it together with a, a short amount of lead time and everyone was so supportive. And so folks who registered, at least the first 50 is the ones that were collated. We collated what people's interests were in terms of all these various things that we can work on in the network and we put them in order of interest from highest to lowest. And it doesn't mean that we'll necessarily only work on the ones at the top. We'll end up working on all of them in, in different ways, but we've put them in that order in terms of what individual people wanted to work on themselves throughout the network. And so the ones in blue are ones that I want us to especially comment on. We're not gonna necessarily go in order, talk about whichever ones you want to, whichever ones you're interested in. And then the ones in blue, I wanna make sure we definitely mention for the Card Oncology Registry, I want Diego to say a little bit more about the international registry and over time in the network, we'll think about how we will integrate the two registries so that we contribute to the informatics and digital portion of the international registry. And so the registry doesn't have to stay, even though it was originally called Chorus, because it sounds nice, we might change it to Coral, Cardio Oncology Registry, which is global. And so we'll certainly change that name to match what we're actually doing as an international network, that, which is very important. So we'll change it to Coral from Chorus. And then for collaboration think tank and education think tank, I want us today to have some general sense of when we want to have those. If we want to have a collaboration think tank, what does that look like? What would we talk about? Who would be there? And then when in the year do we want to have it? And if we do an education think tank, what would that look like? What would we talk about? Who would be there? And when in the year we should have it. And then for CME, we'll just talk a little bit about how, or I'll just mention that the talks that were given in the summit in December will be abstracted, abstracted for CME and will be put online until our next summit, which we're hopefully planning to have in December, 2021. And we're expecting that it would be virtual so that everyone can attend no matter where you are. And so I'm not gonna spend much more time talking, but I will introduce myself. I am Sherry Ann Brown. I'm director of cardio oncology and assistant professor at Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And it just occurred to me if I'm sharing my screen, can you see me? I think so. Yes. Yeah, so in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and the background you're seeing is literally right outside the townhouse where I live, except right now, there's a lot more ice on it than in that picture. And it's been really wonderful for me to connect with folks in cardio oncology over the years. And so this network started coming together a couple of years ago, and then we formalized it with our summit in December 2020. And it's so great to have all of you working together as we advance innovation, collaboration, and education in cardio oncology. So Diego, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk a bit more about the registry and your thoughts and on integrating the informatics and so on from the network. And then um, anyone is welcome to comment after that, especially on these four topics, but on anything on this screen or anything else you want added to the screen. Diego. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, thanks, sherri and thanks again for the wonderful job you always do as, as a social media champion and putting together all, all, all you're doing with the coin network that we're all happy to be part of. So um, yes, so let me mention a little bit about our, about our cardio-oncology registry. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Diego Sadler. I'm a section head of cardio-oncology at Cleveland Clinic, Florida. And um, we've been working with this advocacy network that we started work we did with the um, American College of Cardiology. I co-chair with um, Josh Mitchell and, and Nasida Fadal, uh, the advocacy work group for the American College of Cardiology, Cardio-Oncology. And uh, with work we did also with the Cardio-Oncology Council, we've been working on this project in, in Cardio-Oncology that we started a couple of years ago with 
some advocacy work in the state of Florida. We surveyed cardiologists and oncologists. We generated some synergy for work together between cardiologists and oncologists, getting cardiologists to become part of the chapter of, of ASCO and bringing oncologists to our ACC chapter and really working together to assess knowledge gaps, education gaps, and needs in cardio-oncology, both in the academic and the community setting. So then we moved into a more global network and we brought people from different states from the United States as well as different countries. And we had an initial um, survey that we did about the impact of, of, COVID of the COVID-19 pandemic in cardio-oncology where we collaborated with many of you in this call. Um, we've been working uh, in, in, in trying to work on this registry that finally it seems to have come to fruition over the last few months. So we started our network um, and we've worked and we've established a base where this growing cardio-oncology network has been working also with um, some colleagues that provide us an electronic platform with the Encore investigators from the Netherlands led by Dr. Teske. And then we have some funding opportunity through the Cleveland Clinic to house a project where we could all come together. And we've asked the ICOS scientific committee to be our scientific advisor to generate this project. So it's a triangle be between this large advocacy network and the funding we get from the clinic and the scientific um, guidance from ICOS. So this project is in its initial part, but we've been growing day after day. We already have uh, people who um, want to participate from 86 sites, and that's from 22 United States states, but also from 22 different countries, including countries in North America, South America and Central America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia. So many of you are in this call and uh, we're super happy to be able to collaborate and learn from each other. And we've launched a survey uh, to get what are the needs of people participating. Our plan is in the next few months to launch a pilot study, um, just to go simple in the beginning, getting basic questions in breast cancer, hematological malignancies and immunotherapy. And in all of them, looking at socioeconomic variables and barriers to access to care, both in the academic and um, community settings and how it affects differently in different geographic areas, both in the United States and different countries and different continents. So it's a great opportunity for collaboration. We're very excited. Uh, um, Sherry Ann is also a key part of this project. And as we develop our red cap based database, where all the investigators will have access to and be able to present uh, projects for future prospective clinical trials, provided they have scientific merit and uh, they're actively recruiting. There'll be a wonderful opportunity for people to share, uh, look at questions in the delivery of cardiac oncology care in their own areas or countries. And I think that it's a, a great area for growth and opportunity. So many of you are in this call. Uh, for those who receive the emails, and have not yet sent the survey, I encourage you to please do it. There's a little infomercial there. Um, more than 45 sites have already got their firm commitment and submitted their confirmation of participation with data and demographics about their practices. Um, those who haven't done it yet, uh, we encourage to do it. It's every day we're getting new participants, it's very excited. And for people in this call who uh, are interested in participating and think their institution has a capability in working in a registry, feel free to contact me or contact Sherry Ann. You can contact me at sadlerd at ccf.org or put it in the chat. And I'll be happy to answer any questions regarding the registry and comments and that's pretty much it. Thanks Sherry Ann for the opportunity to talk about our registry and thanks for your great involvement. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm really glad that this is happening and that chorus uh, it will be partnering with or a huge part of CORAL and that we can all work on these together. The floor is open to everyone and anyone. For any of these topics, you know, feel free to let us know what you think about the uh, collaboration think tank, the education think tank, when they should be, what should be in them. We have someone on the call with us uh, who is taking notes for us. And so don't worry about having to take notes yourself. We'll have minutes sent out after this. 
um, to uh, to as many folks that send an email saying you want the minutes. So I'll put the email address in the chat so that we'll know who to send it to. And so please feel free to make comments, ask questions, and you know this is informal and collaborative. So take it away. Hello, hi, uh, Sherry Ann. Again, uh, thank you for this uh, awesome forum and organization, and also thank you, Diego, for those outstanding comments toward the global registry. As far as the think tank, um, are there, uh, I, I'm sorry, you're, you're, I'm in my house, so uh, you're hearing like somebody like actually uh, nailing the door, sorry, but uh, um, okay, but um, I, I, I think we got that taken care of. So um, real life. So um, as far as the think tank topics though, specifically, um, did we have maybe specific topics in mind where we, is this a, kind of potentially around say um, those who have interests, for example, in imaging and slash or something like big data or those who have interests in specific immunotherapy related toxicities? What is the specific angle of some of these think tanks? Great question. Let's throw that out to everyone on the call. What should the think tanks be focusing on or, or talking about? What are your thoughts, Vlad, if you're still on? Um, maybe I'll help everybody by starting the conversation. <laughs> so it's not silence. <laughs> Um, on a Saturday afternoon. Um, yeah, I, I do think some of the think tanks around how do we tackle some of the bigger questions within the field is really kind of the direction that potentially we could think of, at least initially as one of the angles. Um, I think a forum to really think about moving beyond kind of just opinions to how do we um, kind of constructively work together to really address some of the bigger questions within the field, whether it be relation in relation to things like, you know, the role of, you know, imaging and in, in, in surveillance of cardiotoxic uh, disease related to anthracyclines or relating to immunotherapy or targeted therapies or other therapies, or for example, the role of using uh, of where CHIP may be best served as a construct, just kind of pulling the available data and actually moving toward the specific kind of um, addressable points in a more collaborative fashion uh, that can be achieved. Some, something and maybe in that realm, um, that's at least an initial thought. Vlad, Rajesh, Hugo, anyone else? What are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, thanks, Sharian. So I, I think this is an opportunity really to recognize some of the intersection at, at global level. So the fact that there are so many people from different places and as uh, Diego introduced, there are different intersections between cardiology, oncology, uh, professional networks. Um, so this might be really uh, an opportunity to bring ideas across to uh, oncology and um, to think what are the needs on that side. I think we, we see only one angle of the patients that have the problems. And um, we, we try to think uh, as uh, prevention being the first step, right, in, in cardiology. So I think that's really an opportunity for meeting the patients where they are when they reach first the, the oncology colleagues. So uh, it is, it, I, I think that the strength of having a network like this is to, um, be able to generate ideas and, and try to uh, create uh, either research projects or implementation of, of those ideas and, and try to move them to the next step. So <clears throat> uh, regarding the, the, the themes, uh, I would start from preventive, uh, the preventive aspect. That's probably one area that has a lot to develop and then thinking next about diagnosis surveillance and then how do we manage the emerging new therapies in uh, oncology or at the intersection with, with cardiovascular system. 
Yeah, I think just echoing Vlad and Daniel, um, talking about prevention and surveillance. So I think understanding sort of risk stratification, who's at highest risk, looking at risk models and knowing who to identify, that's something that I've been working on. Uh, one with sort of disparities in prevention, you know, as adults with hypertension, African-Americans, um, sort of giving a good sense of who should, you know, the oncologist who's planning for cardiotoxic chemotherapy, who should they refer to uh, their cardiologist and also the importance of surveillance. So I have a registry where I'm looking at those who are lost to surveillance and why. Was it a, you know, are they too far from the hospital? Uh, was there, you know, a distribution or a difference, uh, you know, by race? Was, uh, were they deceased? You know, what, why weren't we able to follow up these patients? And sort of working on sort of the ease of surveillance and just kind of making it a system that'll be um, you know, easier for, for patients as well. Cause I think they can get lost in the shuffle when they're going sort of back and forth, but identifying those who are at highest risk, those who need surveillance, and then how do we sort of implement that in a way that's sort of user-friendly for physicians and patients uh, alike. And I think that's gonna be a lot with working with our oncologist colleagues as well. Hi. Yeah, and I was gonna Hi. say just, have, oh, sorry. I was gonna say just kind of building on what Vlad and Mary were touching on. I think in this spurt is a very hot topic and as well as variation in care. Um, I feel like one of the strengths of this is sort of the global reach. And, you know, I, I reached out to um, Daigle about this a little bit about his registry too. I mean, I think there's so much variability in terms of how these patients are approached depending on the region as well as the country. I think that's um, something I should definitely be looked at and whether it actually impacts outcomes. Cause I mean, I'm pretty sure you know, outside, let's say the US, I, I doubt they routinely survey patients with echoes every three months, for example, when they get hurt to target therapies in other countries or it's probably not as consistent. And I think it may be an opportunity to kind of look at those types of things um, in terms of variation of practice by region. I completely agree with everybody. Um, so, and, and it's very exciting to see the spectrum of people here um, gathering today. I believe this is a great opportunity, not only to advance the field, but to bridge the gap in between the outstanding researchers um, all together here in the educational programs that some of us have the privilege to participate at and, and bridge all these opportunities and people and places to um, the ever expanding field of cardio-oncology and all other sites and places in the world with limited resources. I think this is very exciting. Hi, it's Juby. I just wanted to, you know, just tag in with what everybody was saying. And with the, all the things that we are facing now, that mobile health application area is more more needed and more emerging with the integrating that into everyday life so that patients who have a potential risk or living through managing health in cardiac oncology can manage it better at home and the physician side and research side can intervene and get data and clinical biometrics at the same time from home setting and deploy some sort of service those are the areas that we are seeing and we're starting to work on. And it's more important for us to kind of tie in with that because there is this, that now they call it um, decentralized clinical trial. And there's the consumerism, mobile health. I was um, pulling double duty. Um, I'm mentoring Harvard uh, MIT digital medicine hackathon and earlier to, and they were presenting from Harvard MD and Mass General about patient-generated data and some of the new framework they have developed to capture that. And the earliest is cardiac side. So this will be an area also I would suggest we kind of take a look at maybe the easy win versus some of the other ones that's a longer one. Yeah, I, I completely agree. As a matter of fact, we're working also in prompts and patient reported uh, outcomes and measurements and with some new software called EMOs where patients uh, enter their demographics and, and risk factors and, and quality of life variables uh, while they get registered prior to the encounter. So it's something that does not take additional physicians resources or times. And then there's a validated software use at many locations in, 
in, in our system where you can integrate that in, in electronic platform and REDCap based electronic platform where you capture that data. And therefore we will need something. And I know some other members of the network have also advocated for this. We will need to advance and here comes coin and innovation. There are different platforms where we can automatically extract information. I mean, EMOs is something for patient reported outcomes, but also the new algorithms being worked at different institutions and how to capture data directly from our electronic medical records and, and have um, even some of the models, for instance, that, that Josh Levinson proposed in the initial model, if we have pre-structured models and we can digitize in a way that is reproducible in many of our institutions, then we may come up with a solution to capture all that information and be a, a very large database for research. And that may advance the field significantly. Agree. Hello again, this is Pritish. Uh, so one th when I started the cardio-oncology clinic, um, one thing I learned pretty quickly is that um, these patients are different from just from oncology standpoint and cardiology standpoint. And some of the things is I, I'm trying to spend a lot of time through research, through talking to the patients, discussing with people like you guys, is who are these people? And uh, one of the things I'm, I'm learning that, you know, they're needless to say, not everybody is the same. And um, some people are more susceptible to certain type of chemotherapies. Maybe they have a different exposure, like, you know, genomic susceptibility, whatnot. And some of the ideas that I've been working on is to understand how these patients are different from the other two patients who have either heart disease, but no cancer, and then there's other side to it is a patient who have cancer and never go on to develop heart disease. But then we're working with a very small group of people who uh, develop uh, cardiotoxicities or you know they cross over from one group over the other. And I, you know, some of the things, uh, you know, fascinating things uh, in this time for doing research is I still remember almost eight years ago when I was a resident after hours, I used to go to uh, our cardiologist office and collect data. And then it was pure, like a chart review in a pure manner. But nowadays, recently I just uh, requested to our bioinformatics department, within a week, I got a list of Excel files that I, it would take me almost a month or two if I was by myself collecting data. So I think you know the, the value of integrating um, uh, what we're talking about AI, um, bioinformatics is, is a high time that we use and start learn about these patients. Uh, another thing uh, I think you know we're working on, and I proposed uh, during our first coin meeting, is that a lot of so what I think of um, CT scans and PET scan is like echo for you know what is echo to heart cardiology patients is uh, CT scans and stuff like that is to cancer patients because everybody gets it for either surveillance or staging. And some of the, my current passion is, is to use radiomics. And I think, I'm not sure if it's possible or there's a plan for the future. Uh, we should have some sort of a radiomic based registry where we can, you know, push this data and uh, analyze this data and, you know, get different type of um, information that helps us understand how this, you know, the concept of digital biopsy is there so there's so many things already existing that we just need to start uh, garnish and start, uh, you know, learn more from it. Could I add, um, I think those thoughts, all, all the thoughts that have been conveyed are, are, uh, are brilliant and I think uh, kind of move us in the right direction. Um, some of the thoughts I, I, I heard earlier and maybe I would just kind of try to coalesce it um, in terms of really the function of this uh, group, would it be wise to consider maybe specific topic focused think tanks for which collaboration could then form amongst the members of COIN and um, other potential um, say oncologic, hematologic and other organizations as well. Um, maybe around the topics like we talked about disparities, uh, prevention, um, imaging, um, various other topics that are relevant. 
or maybe we could work toward that. Is that does that seem like something that the group thinks might be viable? It's up for discussion. This is Vlad. I think that sounds great, Daniel. Uh, it, it is really um, uh, um, an opportunity to focus on what the different people are interested in and then to develop from there in parallel um, I think there is an advantage of approaching it that way rather than sequentially with a large group. So I would agree with that. Yeah, something formed like a small work groups. Uh, I mean, obviously people can interact with multiple groups, but I think uh, it, that would be a good start. I think I agree with Danielle. I agree also, great idea. Now someone will mm -hmm. have to be in touch of getting specific topics for the think tanks and, and lead each project. So another task, Sherry Ann, for you to lead through COIN. I think these are all great ideas. And I know that, for example, Irving Lowe is very interested in helping to lead the AI section of COIN. He is the, um, He's the head of the AI section of the, car, of the California American College of Cardiology chapter. And he's also on an AI topic group for the World Health Organization. And so that's something that's really near and dear to his professional heart. And so he'll be helping us to lead that for sure. And so it sounds like a lot of what we've talked about is most relevant to the collaboration think tank. At the same time, we recognize that the education think tank isn't just about how to disseminate education in cardio-oncology, but how to disseminate education relevant to innovation and how to use innovative platforms for that. And so we know that the course that just happened is the biggest, most incredible education course we currently have in cardio-oncology, the ACC course that just happened. And so we wouldn't be thinking to replicate that in any way. We'd be thinking of how can, what will the think tank consider in terms of how to educate folks on the role, the potential for innovation in cardio-oncology and particularly innovative ways of delivering education beyond what's already being done. So those two things would be the main goals and foci of the education think tank. And a lot of what was just said would be the main goals and foci of the collaboration think tank. And so if we were to have these two think tanks, first of all, do we need both of them? And if we do, when would we have them? I was just looking at the calendar and thinking about the fact that for those of you who have grants with NIH, for example, the deadlines are typically in June and then resubmission in the deadline would be July. And then you have October with resubmission deadline in November. So what if we said, for example, early May and early September, would those be good times to have the think tanks, which has the first Saturday in May, the first Saturday in September, or would it be better to space it out even further from those NIH deadlines? But giving us time to have a few months in between, for example, and then a few months before the summit in December. So what are, you all, what are your thoughts on the, that timing if we have the two think tanks? Um, I, thank you again, Sherry Ann. Um, I, I think those, that timing I, I would just maybe suggest seems reasonable. It may be wise to even space it out even further. Thank you for your sensitivity to the NIH deadlines. As you know, I've been late on giving you documents before because of such deadlines. So I humbly appreciate that. But uh, whatever works best for the group. May maybe secondarily on the difference between collaboration and education. Again, I defer to you as this is your vision. Um, maybe a, a suggestion could be that we you know, potentially look at the number of individuals who agree to be part of the working groups um, as kind of a basis to decide, like if, you know, if we have 20 people in the working group, then it makes more sense to split it up. But if you only have like three or four people signing up who are actually doing anything, then, you know, and then you create another separate same topic education group, um, one might kind of wonder like what the bandwidth is for the people and like what, what's actually going to happen with that effort. Great point, thoughts from anyone else? Excuse me. 
Sorry. No. I would yes, like to ahead. talk about uh, education. I think education is very uh, important and essential aspect in cardio oncology. Uh, as uh, many uh, places, there is no standard uh, program or curriculum for uh, how to train and educate people uh, in the cardio oncology. Can we uh, put a platform or a standard for a certain model to be uh, like courses or uh, roadmaps or uh, uh, e-learning to get courses uh, for the education that include the cardiac imaging and cardio oncology or preventive cardiology or, or other uh, tool for more enhancement for education. I think it's very important for adult cardio oncologists and even for pediatric cardio oncologists, there is no still any training or uh, standard or a global standard curriculum for uh, get training. I think we need to establish some courses uh, every annual or every uh, uh, six months to get some model and complete all this model and get the certificate to uh, accomplish the training in the cardio oncology. I think this is very important aspect of when we train our uh, uh, staff and doctor and nurse. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's great. I know that there are a couple of people that came in that haven't had a chance to introduce yourselves. So perhaps you could introduce yourself now and tell us your name, location, your role, your interests and so on. And then either you or anyone else after you comment on what we currently have in terms of education opportunities in cardio-oncology in this country, well, in the United States and worldwide, and also what we have in terms of publications in that regard. Let's start with introduction of a couple of people that just came in. Marielle, do you wanna go first? Sure, <laughs> sorry about that. And I apologize, I'm actually on call, so... Um... <laughs> I'm in and out and that's why I just arrived um, and I might have to leave very soon. So I apologize if I'm not uh, contributing very much to the conversation, um, which you know, I really appreciate. So I'm a um, echocardiographer, cardiologist and um, very interested in cardio-oncology for a long time at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm especially interested in hematological malignancies, um, and obviously the role of imaging. Um, and so I've just jumped in literally, so I'm going to hear what everybody has to say. And thank you for organizing that, sherri I appreciate. Thank you, Marielle. And then Danielle, do you wanna go next? And then um, Danielle, Sierra Lara Martinez, and then a few folks, please give your comments on what's currently available in terms of cardio-oncology learning and also um, publications regarding education. Okay, hello. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Daniel, I'm from Mexico. Um, sorry about uh, mm -hmm. going out or going in. I'm also at the hospital taking care of a family here, uh, COVID-19. So, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Mexican, I'm from Mexico. City. I, I, I am a cardiologist and also training in echocardiography and have uh, some uh, exposure to cardiology at Bart with Arjun Gosh uh, some, some years ago. So uh, thank you for this, for, this, for this invitation and thank you for this, uh, uh, having me in this invitation, Sherry Ann. Also, uh, we are participating actively with, with Diego Sadler. I, I think I, uh, we, we have two, two centers in Mexico City to to get uh, involved in this in this registry, and also our our, our, our focus is based on my, mainly on in, in hematologic and cancer and and bone bone, bone marrow transplant. So thank you for having me. I'm, I'm also in a hurry, so thank you, and I, I hope everyone is uh, keep going healthy, every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Arjun, do you want to give your thoughts on uh, 
your your assessment of the training opportunities and learning opportunities currently available around the world for cardio oncology and comment on who currently has access to them and how we can think about broadening that out to expand the access to the whole cardiovascular team. Uh, thanks, Sharyan. So really interesting question. And I think that um, you know, we've done some work, which uh, some of it you've led on cardio-oncology training in, in the US and also kind of around the world. And I can probably more speak of the UK and the European perspective in that it is part of the curriculum cardio-oncology. Um, so this is within the general cardiology curriculum. So I think it does exist. So in, in Europe, uh, from the European Society of Cardiology, it is in the formal syllabus. And um, I think our aim, I guess, as, as the COIN group is, as the name suggests, the innovative aspect. I think that's really um, one of the main areas. And I would maybe um, just take it slightly to, to the, uh, slightly differently in that, how can we get more oncologists involved also in the educational side? because I think that uh, not only oncology trainees, but also oncologists, they have a lot to offer from purely from the educational perspective, both for them to learn and also to teach us. I think we'll all appreciate whenever we write a paper, if we have an oncologist, we have a completely different paper. So, um, so my feeling would be that uh, there are a lot of resources, even, um, even if you look at the uh, ACC cardio-oncology page, the ACC document that we were involved in, you know, they did uh, produce something about training. ICOS, um, you know, that I'm on uh, one of the councils for, ICOS has also produced a document on training. So I'm not sure if we necessarily need to repeat what's already been done. I'm not sure how helpful that would be. And I think that one of the reasons that you and others kind of set this program up was to have the innovative side. So I would probably support something where we would do something a little bit different. And the thing that comes to mind is how we can attract more oncologists and how we can maybe develop some teaching materials or something along those lines where we can have oncologists more actively involved, because I think that's very helpful. Thank you. So if I may say something, this is Marielle. There was a very um, interesting discussion um, was it uh, Friday or Thursday of, of the Jack Cardio Oncology in how to involve more oncologists. And there were some ideas that were floated that were extremely interesting, like um, having a sort of oncologist corner. Um, and, and of course, I'm, I'm speaking about the Jack Cardio Oncology, but that would be valid, you know, in any website, um, you know, sort of detailing uh, a bit, you know, the treatments and the latest advances um, in oncology in a short way. Yeah, not obviously it's just a reference for um, for people who are accessing this site. And, and that certainly, you know, could get the oncologists maybe more involved in, in what we're doing and also get a chance to more um, cross pollination uh, between oncologists and, and cardiologists. I would like to um, mention that in terms of training, I think as part of involving the next generation of cardio oncology, uh, like fellows that could be interested in cardio oncology, is probably put it in light of what will actually be the competencies that will be most applicable for different career pathways for someone that wants to do cardio oncology in an academic se sector versus how we should it look, what level of con competency should be for someone that wants to do it as a private practice in a community center, which is may or may not be associated to a cancer institute. That sounds an interesting um, concept, um, but uh, I'm gonna bring back the, a bit more on that, uh, the financial situation that um, someone goes into certain type of specialty phases. And a lot of um, hematologists who cannot sustain their practice just doing hematology because they have to take on something else to kind of um, sustain because the volume is not there. So this, um, you have to think about um, what they would end up doing and 
would they be able to get the volume and our current existing healthcare third party reimbursement structure uh, unless they're you know in that research academic situation would be able to sustain them or figure out a way to kind of enable that side too Another thing that I was thinking about is to really space out the timing if we were to have the think tank meetings. We could have two separate ones, one for collaboration, one for education, or we could have one and spend, you know, like a Saturday morning, or we could do it during the week if people prefer and take time off from work. I just keep choosing Saturday morning because that's easy. But I do recognize that that's hard for, for those of us with families, perhaps. And so it doesn't have to be a Saturday morning. So let's just say half a day. And what if we use that half a day to focus on the four to five topics that have been brought up so far to go off of what Daniel has said and what Hassan has said, what many of you have said. Have said. And so I give credit for this to um, Caitlin, who's taking notes for us, and then also to Giselle and Mary, who I asked to make a list of maybe just five to 10 of the key points or the, of the key topics from today. And so one of them, two of them have a lot to do with what was just said. So what if we have a thank, think tank say in August, which is in the middle of all of those deadlines. So we have one in August and it's half a day. And then the four to five topics that would be covered would be one, prevention and disparities. And this can be rearranged however we choose, so please comment on these. Prevention and disparities too. Artificial intelligence and other um, digital innovation. Number three, generating the global red cap registry. Number four, other innovative missions in cardio-oncology, specifically focusing on how to deliver education and how to educate about innovation. And then five, how to involve more oncologists. And so if we chose, we could potentially have those five as maybe an hour each, if it's five hours, and then the six hours for more discussion generally. So that's something we could think about. What do you guys think about that? Do you think if we did something like that and gave each of those five topics an hour and then had another hour for discussion and so on, introductions and so on, do you think that six hours would be too much for something like that? Do you think we should separate them or do you think we should combine it like that? Um, maybe I, I won't fully address the question and thank you again, Sherry Ann and everyone who's spoken. Um, it, it might be, um, maybe I'll just put a shameless plug, but it might be good to kind of also have a specific discussion related, relating to imaging, given it's kind of immense role um, in kind of what we do from a day-to-day -day basis. I, I heard something I believe from Marielle and, and from others that was, I thought, essentially very brilliant and that was to kind of rope in the using electronic media for educational. Um, I, I think that should not be lost upon us as far as what we're trying to do, because that could greatly, that could be a significant contribution from this group. And I think to go along with that, Daniel, when we extract some of those talks from December from the summit and put online as CME until this December, when we'll have more CME, I think that would be a great step toward that. And I think also having our website would be a great step toward that. And we're planning to use cardioonc.org. And we have the domain, but we just need somebody to actually make it for us and maintain it for us. And so we're open to ideas for who wants to do that and whether it's interns or students or if somebody here in a network has that interest and wants to maintain it, that would be great. And so that would be a place too for us to put some of um, that sustainable education and then collaborating as Vlad pointed out collaborating with ACC, AHA, ICOS, that's something that's part of our foundation, recognizing that cardio, that cardio, the Cardiology Oncology Innovation Network coin started out as this network to connect people around the country and the world, recognizing that we want to be connected with ACC, AHA, ICOS and be a, be a part of the overall cardio community and help to bring everyone together. What are people's thoughts on any of that or anything else that's on your mind?
So maybe maybe one thought here is, <clears throat> I think the challenge with the Zoom platform is uh, it uh, is uh, sometimes a little bit difficult to get you know multiple people in uh, in the same sort of conversation, right? So um, it uh, gets uh, the ideas diluted out a little bit. Now I'm hoping August sounds like a great time choice for the different considerations that you mentioned, Sherian. And the question is, is there a way to um, get together in some way? Now I realize this is this is a global effort, so that might be challenging or maybe something that's a little bit more like a hybrid situation. So uh, an alternative to this would be to consider any of the major cardiology meetings, for example, or major oncology meetings that might be conducive to bringing some groups together. Vlad, this is Mariel. I, I, I agree with you. Nothing replaces the face-to-face. -face. I heard that there are some new uh, platforms that allow, and I think it's on Zoom, that allow to have small tables and small rooms. And then, you know, so we could have, you know, if people are interested by different um, aspects, um, you know, we could have, you know, separate groups. And then, because it's hard for people to, all talk when there's like 50 people on the call, yeah? And, and so that might be one way to sort of work around, you know, this very suboptimal situation. But as you say, Vlad, I mean, it's an international group, so it might be very hard anyway to get everyone in the same room. I agree, Mariel. And uh, yeah, so the, I mean, I don't know how many meetings will be in person this year. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And maybe that uh, having these small uh, rooms within a larger meeting might be a good idea, especially if the people in those different areas of focus, um, Sherian, would not overlap so much. So then uh, you probably can have multiple threads in parallel rather than one half a day meeting, right? That is having those points um, one after the other. Mm -hmm. Could I support the last two comments that were made? Um, I, I will say in the fall, we had a meeting for kind of a Robert Wood Johnson cohort, and we had a group of 50 plus individuals, and then we subgrouped into kind of these small chat rooms of maybe five to 10 individuals, and that worked exceptionally well. And we had a lot of great and fruitful conversation as compared to even the 50 um, overall meeting in which, you know, it's a little bit harder to get maybe a thought or a specific question across. You know, Sherry Ann, it's Juby. Um, the Zoom platform has an, a higher version that we use because, um, well, it was originally for, as a patient waiting room or patient different room, I helped design the telehealth side. And so there is a section that of Zoom that you can tap into, or if you want, I, I have it to use that has multiple rooms. You can move people to a different room. Everybody can be segmented into different rooms that you can move them to. Either and, as far as you can use Slack, you know, Slack channel to create different topics and work it if uh, anyone has any interest in it. Great points, I agree 100%. They, this version of Zoom that we're using has breakout rooms available. I think I was a little hesitant to do it in, uh, for example, at the summit, lest anything breaks. But I think it's a great idea and we totally should do it for the think tanks. And so what would be wonderful, what typically works well, is if there are folks that are assigned to making sure that the tech is working, making sure that people get where they need to be and also people assigned to facilitate the discussion in each breakout room. So not only will we need people to volunteer to be in the breakout rooms, but we'll also need people to volunteer to lead the discussion in that room and then someone to volunteer to be the, the take notes and describe and then report out to the big group. And then also somebody to volunteer to be the tech person for that room. And since as the network, we're mostly healthcare professionals and friends, and we don't have a, a huge you know, a staff, so to speak. And so depending on how the network evolves, it will be important, I think, for all of us to think about what we want to volunteer to help with in that regard. 
be the tech person, be the facilitator, be the scribe and report out person. And I think if we just have that for each room, then this could go really well. We already have the breakout rooms available on this Zoom that we're using right now. And Juby, I really appreciate your offer as well. Thank you for your engagement and support. Well, I know that it's 3.01 right now and we um, could go for the other half hour that we had set up for. And it's great to have people coming and, go as, coming and going as available. What I'll do now is start to summarize some of what we've been talking about and then maybe folks can share your wrap up thoughts and then we can be done for today. It's so wonderful to be able to come together from all across the world. So thank you again, Caitlin, for taking the notes. Thank you, Mary and Giselle for the high level points. And so here are some of the points from, from the team taking the notes for us. And so one point is, you know, underpinning all of this, we need to make sure that we focus on having a detailed understanding of surveillance in cancer patients undergoing cardiotoxic chemotherapy. That's an underpinning for cardiac oncology in general. Another one, identifying key prevention strategies for the cardiac oncology patient plan for cardiotoxic chemotherapy. And then the rest are even more relevant as we're thinking about how can innovation play a role in addition to those that we just talked about. So identifying disparities in cardio oncology and developing solutions, using REDCap, as Diego pointed out, to, red, to generate a global registry to extract important patient outcomes, using AI to generate algorithms to identify patients at risk for cardiotoxicity or poor CVD outcomes with cancer diagnosis and can benefit from, benefit from digital biopsies. And I know for a fact, that there are multiple of us around the country thinking or working on things like that. So I think collaboration would be fantastic. Number six, create smaller think tanks as we've been talking about related to key areas, example, prevention disparities, AI and digital health, generation of the global red cap registry, innovative missions in cardio onc and how to deliver education. Next one being how to involve more oncologists, an idea being creating an oncologist corner in a website or a journal to promote collaboration and recognizing we're taking that idea from uh, the um, ACC meeting and the Jack Cardio on discussion. And then the possible August date for the next think tank meeting, considering a hybrid in-person virtual meeting versus an all virtual meeting with small groups to discuss. And I like the idea of the, the virtual meeting with the breakout rooms and if we all volunteer to help with the tech or leading and so on. I think it could go really, really well and then nobody has to travel unless you really want to. And then, uh, and then another idea is to have the think tanks and these virtual receptions in parallel with other national meetings. So for example, what if we plan to have a virtual reception at some point during ACC in May? What if we plan to have a virtual reception at AHA in November? since AHA is already gonna be virtual hybrid and then ACC, it's to be seen whether that ends up being virtual or remains in person. But even if it's in person, we could still do something um, virtual hybrid then in that case. And then of course, it may be difficult for international colleagues to participate and we don't know if in-person meetings are happening. And so I think if we plan on having the receptions or think tanks, if we attach them to the meetings, having them virtually, and then if the meetings are in person, then we can have it virtual hybrid. Sort of like how when we'd have national committee meetings anyway, and you tell people call in if you need to. So then we could have people in a room and then also have that virtual video call in option. And so I like those ideas. And so what we could do, I think August is smack dab in the middle of where we are right now and then having the summit in December. And so perhaps we can plan in August for a think tank and then plan to have breakout rooms and maybe have it three or four hours. The meeting in December was three hours and we all felt we needed more time. And so we thought maybe four. <laughs> and so maybe the think tank could be uh, three or four hours in August. And then we could plan to have a reception at, with the other big meetings too. And it doesn't have to only be ACC and AHA. It could also be HRS or Sky or wherever people are going to be. Wherever people think it would be good to have a virtual reception. It doesn't have to be a whole two hours like we're doing now. It could just be an hour as well. And then we can determine what sort of agenda or not we want to have and just give a chance for people to get together, given that we don't get to do that much in person last year or this year. So that's the overall list of the main points. The minutes will have more details in it than that. The minutes will also have the links and email addresses and Twitter handles from the chat. And so feel free to put any additional ones in the chat and they'll make it into the minutes and email that address that was up if you'd like to have the minutes sent to you. And we took a snapshot of everyone we thought who was here. So we'll try to make sure everyone gets it. But if you don't, please 
send an email and let us know that you didn't get it. And uh, so now I'll just hand over to you all for your final thoughts and greetings. And thank you for joining today. And it's always wonderful seeing all of you. Yeah, thanks, Sherry Ann. Thank you, I think this is thank a great start. Much. Okay. Thanks so much, Sherry Ann, and everyone. Thank you.